to Sunrise Daily and we're looking at the very contentious issue of uh, the war against corruption and of course there's so many sides that have presented themselves concerning the recent monies that were discovered at the Ikoyi residence and uh, joining us to look at this further is Ikejuku Ikeji is a legal practitioner I want to thank you so much indeed for coming this thank morning. you Gimba for having me you have seen how this has played out it's a matter of fact it's turning to be something one would consider as messy circus do you true. think that the EFCC are able to manage the investigations properly? Um, whether they are able to manage their investigations properly, yes, they are able in terms of the fact that they are personnel by qualified people. So they have that ability. But in, but in terms of whether they are using that ability effectively, in terms of whether they are doing it effectively, I doubt. And the evidence on ground shows that they are not doing it effectively. You find that they put the cat before the horse. They usually um, make announcements of arrests, make announcements of um, discovery of funds before you hear them start saying that they, have, they are commencing investigations. So they are always faster than their investigative abilities. But if they properly tap within themselves, what they have as human resources, they are able, but they are not showing that ability. The latest we're hearing about this uh, latest discovery, $43 million in the Koi residence, is that perhaps all the apartments there should be searched again. <laughs> Do you think that perhaps there's more that could be discovered in an apartment like that? I, I think that there is hardly any home today that you won't find um, loads of cash stored by, stored by owners of the homes. Hardly any house or flat that you won't search and you'll see, you won't see money. Let's face that fact. But the extent to which that money is criminal is the question. For example, Mr. Jones may decide to keep 10,000 Naira in his house in, ca in case of um, eventualities. Mr. B.C., on the other hand, may keep 10 million naira that he looted from the public treasury in his own house too. That is where the problem is. So I know that in every home or in every, most offices, you find that people keep monies. They keep money. Some in offices, they call it impressed. They keep money. But the extent to which that money is criminal is the question that needs to be asked. And I don't think that it is necessary to start going from house to house searching people. That would be infringing on people's um, fundamental rights. And that brings to the question of to what extent is EFCC following due process in their discoveries? To what extent? Because before money will be deemed to be criminal. It has to be criminal, it has to be a proceed of crime. There has to be a missing fund somewhere. And that is where they get it wrong. They ought to first, they've seen the money, they know where the money is, they guide it, they guard it. They put an eye on the money and then commence investigation, underground investigation, and get to the root of the source of that money. With the roots, it will now, they will have the opportunity to know that that money is criminal and that is where their case lies not in the money itself the process is one that is very uh, important and they have obtained search warrants to go into those other apartments in that same building they are on the right part aren't they yes such warrant is it's um it's legal it's in the law the acj that is the administration of criminal justice act 2015 provides for such warrants where you suspect that there are proceeds of crime or where you suspect that there are criminals um, staying you can obtain a search warrant to search any apartment any house any building whatsoever and so they are on the right track if they have reasonable suspicion that in those flats that there are um, uh, monies that may be proceeds of crime we have NIA on the one hand, you yeah. have got uh, EFC finding out this money, you have some state governments that are saying that this money belongs to us. The CBN has not said anything about this. Yes. Do you suppose that the CBN should be voicing out as to how this money came out or if a more thorough investigation should reveal or is this being shrouded in secrecy? Absolutely, I think it's being shrouded in secrecy and there's just one way, way to it. 
um, I would like to use this opportunity to call on the National Assembly, either the Senate or the House of Representatives, to immediately institute a public investigative hearing pursuant to sections 88 and section 89 of the 1999 Constitution as, amend, as amended for the purpose of discovering and finding out exactly who and who are behind that body and how come that money came out in mint, came out in clean mint. How, where, the, where is the source? Who owes them? Who, who for what purpose? And for what, um, to what extent can we say that some, of, some government officials are culpable? That is very key. Because public institutions need to be protected. And the fact that you can point, pinpoint one or two public officials who are corrupting the process, you are going a long way in fighting the war against corruption. Because the real problem is not in the stealing. Stealing is petty. It's petty. People just go and put their hands in the common till, in the common patrimony. It's stealing is... It's low character. The real problem is in the corruption. The, re the reason why if you steal, you are not easily discovered. That is where the problem is. And a public investigation will help in assessing uh, the, 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 the fundamental reasons behind that loophole that enables people to steal from the common till and they will not be easily discovered. Now, perhaps um, it's... It will be in order yes. to think that um, if the EFCC should move into not only that apartment, because you have the whistleblower policy, yes. perhaps we have more whistleblowers that are blowing this whistle and then you're discovering more monies. Yes. To what extent has this whistleblower policy been able to f help the fight against corruption? Well, I think it has. It, it is helping in discovering stolen um, of, um, funds, missing funds. It is not helping in fighting corruption. We must be very we must be very clear about it. The whistleblowing situation we are seeing today is helping the government to discover funds that are unexplainable. But they are not helping corruption because corruption is a process. They are not helping us to know the reasons why such monies will leave government coffers into private hands undetected. That is the essence of fight against corruption. And another thing is that it will be easy to throw the whistleblowing policy into the dust bins. Be why? Because it has no legal backing. You, let us use this analogy. You get 5% of $10 million, um, perhaps that's about $500,000 thereabouts. That $500,000 gets into your pocket and it's coming from Azure Medley from government coffers. Now, the law provides that no money belonging to the government shall be expended, shall, shall be spent without appropriation. Now, how do you explain that you're spending 500000 naira, $500,000 without appropriation? That is the reason why we are asking that the whistleblowing policy be made a, legislat a legislation. I, I thought that 5% uh, that, uh, that is to be given to the whistleblower is, is tax-free. Uh, you could just have that money and spend it as you like. Uh, well, even I, I don't know about whether it's tax-free or not, but the, the, the point has to be made that it is firstly government money. It is common patrimony. Well, it can't be government money again yes. after it's been given to you. At the point before it was given to you, it was government money. When it is given to you, it becomes your private property. But before it is given to you, upon recovery... It gets into the government treasury. The implication of not making it, um, um, uh, enacting a law to back it, is that the rest of the balance, government officials can spend as they like without accountability. Mm. So there is need for a whistleblowing law, a law, a statute to back the policy. Now it's just an executive proclamation an executive declaration that has no legal effect. So are, are, are the legislators foot dragging on it? I wouldn't know what is going on there, but that should be one of the, um, one of the uh, priorities that the National Assembly should have today. We should, and there are a lot of intricacies in that, in that um, policy, in that law. The, it, it's not a law that you, you pass secretly or surreptitiously or quietly. It's a law that you have to advertise, send to the public, let 
people putting their making their make their inputs because it's a very delicate situation. Threats to life is involved. People, a lot of people, a lot of thieves who will steal and will know clearly within their circles who and who may be the source of revelation that they have stolen money. For example, there may just be only four people in the knowledge of the fact that the money is stolen. So it will, the whistleblowing will come from only four of them. And so when one person has the money and, it, and a, a whistle, the whistle is blown on him and the money is discovered, surely the person's um, target would be among the rest of the three. And that means that the rest of the three would have their lives under threat. So the whistleblowing policy has to take all those things into consideration. Mm. It's not just mounting it, shouting it, encouraging people to come forward. There has to be um, is, um, institutional structures in place to ensure that it is effective. People's, people do not lose their lives just because they whistleblow.